Doggies are good boys and girls. They can teach us so much. Why, one time a doggy helped a friend named Ivan learn all about the human brain. He wanted to know why doggies drool, so he started ringing a bell every time his fed his doggy, until the doggy got used to the bell whenever he ate food. And then one time he rang a bell without any food, and you know what happened? The doggy drooled. That doggy learned how to drool just by hearing a bell. What a smart doggy. Ivan figured out that our brains work the same way. You might not drool when you hear a bell, but your brain can connect different things and cause you to react accordingly. You can try this experiment at home. Start ringing a bell whenever you feed your doggy and see if it starts to drool. Does your doggy drool? Congratulations! You're a scientist. Okay, Zoe, you run along now. You have fun. Okay, you go play. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Pavlov was a f monster. When you hear the name Pavlov or something about a Pavlovian response, you probably think something along the lines of the story that I just told, that Pavlov was practically a dog trainer and he rang a bell, the dog drooled, and by doing so he learned something fundamental about psychology that changed that field forever. <laughs> yeah, you can say goodbye to that myth. The thing that Pavlov discovered is today known as classical conditioning. They didn't call it classical conditioning back then because it was brand new at the time. Uh, it was a breakthrough, actually. People didn't think that you could train a person to perform a reflex. Pavlov changed that. He found that if you paired a conditional stimulus, in this case the food, with a neutral stimulus, in this case the bell, then you could eventually get the person to respond in a reflexive way to the neutral stimulus the same way they would to the conditional stimulus. In other words, if you ring a bell while you feed a dog enough times, eventually just ringing the bell will cause the dog to salivate as if there were food. And this opened up a whole new field of psychology known as behaviorism. For the first time ever, we started to realize that there's a connection between psychology and physiology. Our modern understanding of learning and addiction and several psychological disorders all stemmed from this one field. If you went to a Western school, it's almost guaranteed that you were taught according to the works of John B. Watson and B.F. Skinner. The way your teachers designed their classes was based on what they wrote about positive versus negative reinforcement or what their critics wrote about it. Either way, all of that started with Pavlov. Have you ever worked out with Wii Fit or just tracked your workouts on an app? That is straight up behaviorist gamification. The app might as well just ring a bell. All of that is to say that the work that Pavlov did with his dogs shaped our society today in some really fundamental ways. His importance is beyond question. It's how he got there that's questionable. Because it turns out he wasn't trying to study the mind at all. He wasn't a psychologist, he was a physiologist. Psychology actually was brand new at the time. It kind of diverged from philosophy in 1879, which was also the same year that Ivan Pavlov graduated from the Russian Imperial Medical Military Academy. What he was trying to study was digestion, or the digestive glands specifically. He actually had a series of lectures on the digestive glands that became a seminal book in this field, creatively named The Work of the Digestive Glands. Over 12 years of studying this subject, he became something of an expert on saliva and digestive secretions and how they work in the body. His work on the mind only happened when he realized that it had some kind of an effect on the digestive system. It was just an extension of his digestive research. Now with all this in mind, it should be no surprise that his methods were more uh, biological in nature. So before I continue and explain exactly what he did with his dogs, I'm going to do something I've never done on this channel before actually. I'm going to issue a trigger warning because if you are a dog lover and if you don't like the idea of dogs being hurt or being traumatized, you are not going to like what I'm about to say. And if it's not something you want to hear, I'm going to put a little timestamp right here. You can go to that timestamp and skip the, the worst of it. And uh, yeah, I'm just giving you that warning. I'll wait. All right, still here? Why? Why, why, are you, why are you still here? Do you, do you like hearing about dogs being abused? Do you, do you get off on something like that? What is wrong with you, you sick son of a bitch? By all accounts, Pavlov was a skilled surgeon, and he was also very tenuous about the scientific method. It wasn't enough to know that his dogs were drooling. He had to know how much and when. So, to find this out, he created holes in the dog's digestive systems, one in its stomach and one in the esophagus coming out of its throat. The one in the stomach would collect gastric juices and the one in the throat basically prevented the dog from eating. So if the dog did eat something or swallow, it would just, you know, slide out the throat hole. Once in this state, the dogs were basically suspended over the floor 
in a harness. And from time to time, food would be put in front of the dog, just out of reach, just enough for it to make some digestive and gastric juices, which were then collected. Just a reminder, this is not a scene from Frankenstein or the reanimator. This actually happened to hundreds of dogs. And sadly, once in Pavlov's hands, they lived short, very hungry lives. The longest lived one lasted only 10 days. <sighs> All right, so those of you who have rejoined us, you're welcome. I saved you from the most squeamish bits, but you are back just in time because guess what? It gets worse. Because at this point, you're thinking about, you know, how terrible these experiments were and all that, sure, but you're also thinking about what I said earlier about how transformational it was to the world and how important his work was, and you're, you're you know, right now you're kind of weighing the pros and the cons and all that, but we haven't gotten to how he paid for this research. Turns out those digestive secretions he had on tap from Fido were actually considered a, a treatment for indigestion at the time. People drank it. It was like the Maalox of 1900 Russia. Pavlov sold his dog juices to pharmacies to pay for his experiments, but of course there's only so much juice one dog can make. If you're going to make any real money at this, we're going to need a lot more dogs. So more dogs were brought into Pavlov's House of Horrors. According to a biography by Daniel P. Totus, he basically just set up a factory where dogs were brought in, tied up, and drained of their gastric juices. Until they died. The lab sold 3,000 bottles of gastric juices per year and those sales counted for about 41% of the lab's budget. Most of the dogs that came into Pavlov's lab had nothing to do with the experiments whatsoever. They were just juice machines. It's important to note, none of this was a problem at the time. He was internationally applauded, actually. He was given the 1904 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. If it makes you feel better, he had to give the money that he won for that back to the state in 1917 after the Russian Revolution. After the revolution, he struggled a bit, like most Russians did, but over time, he thrived under the Soviet regime. Lenin and later Stalin began to realize how important his celebrity and his influence was, and they basically provided anything that he wanted so that he could expand his labs. He ran the Medical Military Academy under the Soviets just as he had under the Tsars, and when he died of pneumonia at the age of 86, over 100,000 people came out for his funeral. And ever since then, his legacy has been sanitized into the story of the man who rang a bell and made a dog drool. The first dog whisperer, basically. I bet most of you never even knew anything about this. I mean, I know I was blown away by it. But I think what makes this most interesting to me is it really makes you have to question, how do you measure a person's actions? Millions of people have been helped through the understanding that this accidental discovery opened up to the world. People with PTSD, anxiety, all kinds of phobias. They've all benefited from this. And you could probably even make the argument that millions of dogs have better lives now thanks to what Pavlov did. You know, uh, dog trainers today rely almost exclusively on positive reinforcement to get the results they want. Where do you think that came from? Before Pavlov, it was a lot more stick and a lot less carrot. It's easy to be disgusted by his methods. Almost impossible not to be, but if it puts a net positive into the world, you, you gotta ask, you know, did the end justify the means? As Pavlov's contemporary Leon Trotsky once said, a means can only be justified by its end, but the end in turn needs to be justified. By the way, Pavlov and Trotsky were contemporaries, but they were hardly friends because Trotsky was Jewish and Pavlov was notably anti-Semitic. Because of course he was. It should also be noted that millions of animals are experimented on and killed in labs all around the world today. That includes monkeys, pigs, goats, and countless mice and rats. But that same ambiguity can be applied to them, you know? Science continues to push forward, expanding our lifespans and improving our health. Could it be argued that human progress is only possible through the suffering of others? Is that just part of life? Every rose has its thorn kind of thing? It would it be better for us to slow down a little bit? I'll leave that for you guys to discuss in the comments. I want to give a quick credit to Ken and Kale of McCann Dogs. They were actually the ones who brought this up to me when we were talking at VidCon earlier this year. I had no idea that this history of Pavlov was what it was, but they brought it up and I was like, yeah, I gotta do a video about that. So if, if, you, if you're interested in dog training, uh, I will put a link right here and down in the description. Definitely go check out McCann Dogs. They're awesome people. Well, all right, I hope that wasn't too traumatic for you. Thanks for watching. Uh, T-shirts are available at the store at answersofjoe.com slash shirts. Uh, this is your first time here. Google thinks you might like this video. You might want to check that one out or any of the others down the sidebar. And if you like them, I do invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. All right, with that, you guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week, hug a dog for me, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.